All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you so much for giving in these incredible gifts called sacraments, the grace we receive. And the summit and the source of all of it is the Eucharist, Lord. Each time we come to Mass, the incredible love, the incredible sacrifice that you offered up for us you give us the strength, you give us the grace, and you walk with us in our daily lives, Lord. Help us over the next few months, help prepare our children, our students, our godchildren towards their first Holy Communion. Make it be an incredible day, but just one day in a series of many that'll last a lifetime. Guide us in our talk tonight, Lord, and guide us towards receiving the Eucharist for us the next time we go to Mass and for our children in April. We ask this in your glorious name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we're going to go right to the back of the packet first. If at all possible, Please sign this form tonight. This gives permission to the teachers to work with your children uh, and use the unconsecrated host. Okay, but we need your permission to do that. If your child is gluten intolerant, you know, let us know. You can even write it here on the form. If there is a reason and you do not want to do this for whatever reason, please let us know. But if you can get these signed and turned in tonight, uh, make everything much simpler. All right, let's go to the front of the packet. Okay, so rehearsals for kids that go to Christ the King School, your rehearsals will happen during class time. For the kids on Sunday, it will actually happen the day that they make their first Holy Communion. It'll be on Saturday, April 23rd from nine to 10 o'clock here in the church. We will practice that morning. Now they'll practice in class the next time we have class over the motions uh, and everything, but the actual in uh, church practice will be the day they make the first Holy Communion on April 23rd. The kids in the school will make their first Holy Communion the next day. 2A will be at eight o'clock mass, 2B will be at 10, and 2C will make theirs at the 12 o'clock mass. The first communion attire, girls, a uh, short or long white dress with veil, flowers, ribbon on head, white shoes. Boys, white shirt, white tie, dark slacks, dark shoes. And we ask that you leave their hands free. In other words, no gloves, no Bibles, so they can receive uh, the Lord on their hand. They can create a, a throne for him. Now, for the boys, I have the hours on here for the ties where they can be purchased in the bookstore. If the PTO in the school decides to do a video, uh, we will let you know, but right now that's to be determined. And child care, please let the daycare know by April 18th in the emails there at the bottom. If you have any family members or friends that are deacons or priests that would like to be part of a particular mass, they need to let us know by the 25th. Okay, especially if they're out of the diocese because we have to uh, send a certain paperwork. Included in this packet, like I said earlier, on the back is the permission slip if you can get that filled out and signed in tonight. And what I'm gonna spend the next few minutes going over are the mass sheets. The more mystery our kids and the more mystery and grace that we will get out of Mass each and every week. All depends on how much participation that we actually take in each and every Mass. So if you can get here a few minutes early to have them settled, that would be great. My wife is always really good, even my kids today, my almost 18-year-old, almost 26-year-old, when we're in the 
car coming to Mass, reminding the kids to come up with something, some things they need to pray for, something that they're struggling with to place on the altar, something that went well this week that they can place at the foot of the altar so when they come in and they pray. But they're going through these Mass sheets every week, and you'll notice that these Mass sheets build. The first week, it's simply going to talk about who was the priest that was presiding, how many altar servers they were, there were, what color were, did the priest and deacon wear, and then it'll start going into the readings, and then that'll build. First, the first reading, then the first reading, and maybe the psalm, or the second reading, and then, fi you know, finally, the last couple actually have two pages, but building on that participation in Mass really will help them start to see the mystery, and will make this uh, not only an incredible First Communion, but also help them to understand the Mass much better. And that's what those sheets are for. This is not just an assignment. This is something hopefully they're going to be doing for the rest of their life. Once a week at least, coming to Mass. And the more they see that mystery, the more they participate, the more they'll start to see it. So if you lose anything in this packet, okay, you go to the CTKLR website, go up to uh, uh, sacraments and then go over, um, excuse me, go up to faith formation and to the right, it'll be sacraments. Go down to first communion and then scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll find the PDF for this and for anything else that we hand out for first communion. So real quickly in wrapping up, I'm gonna go over this, the bottom of the second page, the key dates one last time. On March 25th, uh, the visiting clergy form needs to be turned in. On April 4th, uh, permission forms are due. Hopefully they're being turned in tonight, but no later than April the 4th. And then April the 14th, Youth Faith for uh, uh, students will begin our first communion novena, which we will email out at a later date. And then April 15th, the CTK kids will start their novena. If you need to use the nursery, please make them by April 18th. And then comes the day. Uh, April 23rd, we'll have the rehearsal for Sunday kids. And then that afternoon at the 5 o'clock mass. And then the CTK kids will be the next day on the 24th. Last thing. Back here, we have the teachers. If y'all will stand up, please pray for them. Communicate with them. Ask them any questions that you have. This should be a very, very special day and hopefully one of many to come. But please pray for them and we'll pray for you as well that we're all guiding together your kids towards First Holy Communion. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be in the back when we're done. So Father Eric, turn it over to you. All right. Thank you for uh, being here tonight. Glad to have the chance to uh, share with you. At, uh, we're just coming off now of having celebrated first confessions, uh, always beautiful. Uh, to uh, They all write us cards thanking us for being there for them. And uh, I hear many times over the, the comments about being nervous and then coming out feeling very clean. And so we see the power of that grace at work in their lives. It's, it's really a great privilege uh, for all of us to be able to witness God at work in that way. Uh, and it highlights really for us what, what we are about here, that our lives really are this continuous, constant walk with God. And God is ready to provide literally everything for us. In fact, our belief tells us that this God who gives us life God does not just create us and say, okay, now you're there, do the best you can. God does not sit back and watch to see whether we do well or not. But the God who gives us life sustains us all along. At any given moment of our life, God were not providing for us life itself. We would simply cease to exist. So we are in continuously living in this dependence on God. But part of the relationship with God, part of how he designs this, is that it's supposed to be bound by love. And love, by definition, must be chosen. Love is not something that can be forced. 
And so God sustains us continuously. And God never fails because God never changes. God can't cease to love even for a moment. But we, we're continuously trying to respond to that love. And we do so better or worse at different times. And part of how we do better, part of how we love more, is a greater awareness that this is what's happening. One of the challenges that I see for people as they talk about growing in their faith will be that, well, I can do this and this, I need to do better, I need to try harder. And while it's true that we need to put in the action of our lives, we need to exercise our will for God, that in fact what makes us holy, what makes us do better, is not we try harder, but we become more and more aware of what God is doing. That we accept with fewer and fewer obstacles what God is doing. And so it's that continuous desire to surrender so that God penetrates our lives, pervades what we do, so that we experience at a richer level, a more abundant way, what life is. So the joys of life are more joyful. The challenges of life are supported by God's strength. The crosses, the suffering, the sorrows of life are given consolation by the Lord who walks with us on the journey. So it's important as we talk about First Communion that we're, we're celebrating this with a ceremony that's beautiful with the kids dressed up and we gather with our community. And it has all of these beautiful external features, but the point of every external feature is to draw us more deeply into this dynamic of God's love for us and our response to it. In fact, as I've thought over the years about the Christian life in general, it seems to me that there's one word that best captures everything our faith is really about. One word. And that word is communion. And by communion, I don't just mean the act of receiving the Eucharist. I don't just mean the celebration of First Communion. The reason that First Communion is as significant as it is, is that the whole reality of life with God is about communion in the larger sense of unity. What God most wants is a closer unity with him. He creates us in perfect unity with him. Heaven that we long for, that we live for, that we anticipate, heaven will be perfect unity forever. So every other aspect of church life is meant to enhance, to draw us into unity, communion, everything. It's why we practice charity. We are called on, expected by Jesus to practice charity because we are united to the people we serve. We are supposed to look at another person and see, this is my brother, my sister. Because of the unity we share in Christ, I have an obligation to them. So the charity of the church is about communion. We gather for Mass because at the heart of our gathering is the Lord who offers himself so that we can be brought into communion. It's why we consider family life the heart of human society. It's why marriage is the first building block of human society, because it is an expression of unity in the particular way that a family loves each other. So everything revolves around communion. And because our growth in holiness really revolves around awareness of that, then this preparation for First Communion is a chance for us to focus more clearly, that the biggest challenge for us is how much other stuff is vying for our attention. <clears throat> how many other voices there are in our world that try to tell us what matters most, what gives greatest meaning, what are the values that we are trying to live by. There's a beautiful passage in Matthew's Gospel that says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given besides. Seek first 
the kingdom of God. The idea that everything else will then be given besides means that God is not asking us to abandon all the rest, but to see everything else in light of communion. And so when we're preparing your children for First Communion, the goal is that this be a first step toward that lifelong growth, a deeper and deeper and deeper awareness that God offers us life itself, that God sustains us and calls us into communion. And this is a chance to help your child understand this significant moment and it's a chance for all of us, a chance for all of us to take a look at our own communion with God, to be able to see reflected in these children the beautiful power of God that gave them life, that draws out of us the most pure kind of love. And so we aspire to really be more. I know all of you have experienced that. You look at your children and you aspire to be more for them. You want them to grow and understand how much you love them. You probably experienced that feeling of telling them that you love them and knowing that they don't grasp what you're really talking about. So communion is really about growing in that sense in our life with God. And because God desires this communion with us so much, God comes at it from lots of different ways. God gives us the entire church to help draw us into that reality. He gives us the teaching of the church so that we can get our heads around it. He gives us the command to charity so that we can practice it in the love of neighbor. He gives us the sacraments so that his very life can penetrate into our lives. So one way that God does it is he holds up what is good and says, aspire to this. But then God also says, because I know you're conflicted and I know it will be difficult for you, I'm going to hold you accountable to it. And so we have commandments. We have the command in the church that we have an obligation to go to Mass every Sunday. That's not, first of all, because God makes the rules and so God says you have to go to Mass. It's because God desperately wants communion with you. And he will do everything he can to get you here. He will call and invite. He will push and so at the beginning of this preparation now, being here tonight, this is primarily what I ask you to do, to stop for a moment and listen, to say, okay, God, this is a privileged moment in my life. This is not a privileged moment only in my child's life. This isn't just about, I want my kid to have the best experience. This is about God saying, I love you and I love your child. And the more you understand how your love for your child can be brought into my love for you, again, the richer and more abundant life itself is. This is the opportunity. And so tonight, we start really thinking about what that means. We start asking God to draw us in, to give us a greater awareness, to take steps in holiness because we remove obstacles to what God wants to give in our lives. Some of those obstacles may be practices that stand in the way. And we had the opportunity to reconcile those practices. And many people went to confession and removed those obstacles. And so that means a clearer path forward. And so God's already taken that step. And now he lays in front of us all the other opportunities that can come from our preparation so the handout that I gave to you, the loose paper that was attached to your packet, this, this is a, a handful of quotes that I want to reflect on a little bit more with the time that we have, and I offer to you uh, for kind of a beginning of reflection as you look at your own preparation, your conversation with your family, with your child making First Communion over the course of the next uh, few months. So we're going to talk about this, but we don't ever want to come into the church and talk about First Communion. We want to come into the church and talk about the Eucharist, talk about communion with God without recognizing that he's here right now. 
that we have this tabernacle, the Lord truly present for us. And so as we talk about the ways we can grow in communion, this moment is one of those ways. This moment is an invitation by, from God. And so no doubt you've had busy days. No doubt some of you had some difficulty getting here today, probably back and forth with your spouse. Who's going to make it? And so I want you to look at this moment now as a response to the invitation that the Lord gives you. So we're going to talk a little bit about these quotes. And as we do, I invite you to just underline any word or phrase, anything that stands out to you. And then I have the monstrance there on the altar, and I'm going to bring the Blessed Sacrament out so that we can have some time to talk to the Lord directly. This is going to be a, a time for us to pray as well as to reflect, as well as to learn. So go through these and ask you to take note of what might help you over the next few months of your own growth in communion. So the first one is from John chapter 6. Catholics are uh, often famous for not being able to quote Bible, Bible verses very directly. But every single Catholic should know instantly John 6 as the foundation for our belief in the Eucharist. So John 6 starts with the multiplication of loaves and fishes and the people see the miracle and they come back the next day ready for more. They just witnessed something extraordinary and now they want more. And so Jesus begins to teach them. And he begins to teach them about the bread of life. This is our foundation as Catholics for understanding the Eucharist. And Catholics, more than any other Christians, take what it says in John chapter 6 literally. And so it's a chance for us to hear the words of Jesus. So he starts talking about the bread of life. And then he says, I am the bread of life. This crowd that's gathered around him is stunned by what he is saying. They don't know how to, they don't know how to make sense of it. And it tells us over the course of John chapter 6 that Jesus says certain things and then it says the crowd murmurs. They start complaining. What is he talking about? And there's a pattern that every time he says something surprising and they start murmuring, Jesus' response is to double down further, to say it more strongly, to ramp up the shock level of what he's saying. And so what I've pulled out for you is a part of that shocking speech of Jesus toward the end of John chapter 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. This is our belief as Catholics. This has been a difficult belief since Jesus first said it and they quarreled over his words. It's been difficult ever since. Even in the last few years, there have been surveys conducted by the Pew Research Center questioning Catholics. Do you really believe what the church teaches? And the numbers are often shocking how few people actually believe what Jesus gives to us. And yet here we are preparing your children and telling them literally this is true. I think one thing that can help us, especially if we've been raised Catholic and we've been hearing this our whole life, is to sit for a minute with just how impossible this seems. We need to kind of let it sink in that this is practically impossible to believe. The difference between 
impossible and practically impossible is that we have a God who also tells us, for God, all things are possible. Even the God who created the universe becoming food in the form of bread and wine. Now, after Jesus says this, one of the lines that follows says, many of his followers left him that day. He let them go. He let them go because they did not misunderstand what he meant. He meant what he said. What follows many of them leaving is that the 12 apostles are standing there listening to Jesus say all of this and as he watches the people go he turns to them and he says what about you? What do you think of all that? They don't say oh yeah we got it that makes sense we're, we're good. What they do say is where would we go? We've come to believe in you they say. We have come to believe in you. In other words, I have no idea what you're talking about. But all the rest of it that you do, that gives me reason to say, I trust you. And so they trust. Now we know where it goes from there. They didn't know where it would go. Where it goes from there is moves to the Last Supper where he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And so we have both what Jesus says at the Last Supper with what he says here, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And so we come to the foundation of the Catholic understanding that the celebration of Mass, which brings us the Eucharist, brings us into contact with Christ truly present, coming to us as food, because food allows for communion in a way that nothing else does. Food, the food that is Christ himself, becomes us as we consume him and take in this reality. So this is the scriptural foundation of what we believe as Catholics. Over the centuries, there was much debate over, well, what does that mean exactly? And they debated, well, what is the, the truth of what he says? How do we make sense of it? How do we define it? And so over the centuries, different words were used to explain what was happening. Various other churches kind of would split away and say, no, we have a different understanding of that. And through it all, we believe that it was the Holy Spirit guiding the church to a deeper and deeper understanding of what's really happening. So that development continues even in our day. And so we have continuous, re, uh, continuous renewals of teaching. In fact, one thing that you will see over the next year, starting um, this fall, this summer, this fall, the bishops of the United States are going to engage in a Eucharistic renewal, a chance to invite all Catholics in the whole country to deepen the understanding, to try to respond to the bad survey numbers that talk about people struggling to believe. So the other quotes on this page come from the church's teaching as it has developed its understanding of the Eucharist over time. Now in our day, the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us the most complete synopsis of Catholic faith in one, in one volume. And at the, at the heart of the teaching on the Eucharist in the Catechism, there you see number 1324. There's a beautiful line that I've pulled out for you. So it tells us that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The source and summit of the Christian life. So those two words by themselves can be fruit for our prayer. What does it mean for the Eucharist to be the source? Meaning everything comes from that. Everything flows from there. Because if the Eucharist is Jesus entering into our very bodies, there's nothing else we can do that provides a closer connection with God, a deeper encounter with God. And because of that, everything flows out of that. And it's the summit, the highest possible experience of our life with God. 
Heaven will be perfect unity with God forever. The Eucharist is a moment of closest possible unity with God here and now. There is nothing closer to the reality of heaven than receiving the Eucharist. God gives everything. The limitations around the Eucharist come from how well we are disposed to receive it, how fully accepting we are of what God is doing. And so it has the chance to be the summit, the highest possible moment of unity with God. And the rest of the life of the church is meant to help draw us into that moment. Even the Mass itself starts by acknowledging that we are in need of mercy and asking God, saying, I confess my sins. Lord, have mercy. So even the Mass itself is meant to prepare us for this moment where we have this crowning unity with God. The Eucharist, that is an obligation for us every week, is because we need the grace that it gives. It's the source. If we neglect the source, then nothing else can follow from the life of faith. The source provides what we need. And so think about the source of the Christian life as the weekly renewal, the weekly filling up of what God wants to give you so that you can live out the rest of your week with the grace of God. That's the source. The second part of this quote says, the Blessed Eucharist is, in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the church. Everything that is good about Catholic life is contained in the Eucharist because the Eucharist is Christ himself. Everything that we need in our faith is right here in this moment. This is the opportunity for us. The other quotes on this page both come from St. John Paul II. The first one that he wrote an encyclical, an encyclical is a teaching document, uh, and he dedicated a year of the Eucharist. I think it was 2004 or something like that. And so at the end of that year, he wrote this teaching to try to deepen our understanding of the Eucharist. And then he wrote a different document um, on the Lord's Day, on what does it mean for us to treat Sunday as the Lord's Day. So a couple of things I want to point out from these two quotes, and then we're going to take some time in prayer. So again, underline anything that stands out to you so you can reflect on it more as we go through the, our time in prayer. So from the encyclical on the Eucharist, in the humble signs of bread and wine changed into his body and blood, Christ walks beside us as our strength and our food for the journey. And he enables us to become, for everyone, witnesses of hope. If in the presence of this mystery, reason experiences its limits, the heart, enlightened by the grace of the Holy Spirit, clearly sees the response that is demanded and bows low in adoration and unbounded love. Two things I want to point out from that paragraph in particular. In the middle there, it says that he walks beside us so that we are able to become witnesses of hope. This communion is an invitation to come closer to God, but we are always not only brought closer to God, but closer to each other. We are brought into communion with God, but into the communion of the family of God, and so we are connected to each other. And Jesus expects that we respond by being witnesses. You're here tonight because your first responsibility of witness is to your child. But it goes beyond that to the rest of your family, to really anyone that you encounter. Picture being a witness 
as you go about your work week or your interactions with friends and family, picture that in light of having been at Mass on Sunday where you came into contact with the source of all that you need for the Christian life. That means as you interact with everybody throughout the course of the week, flowing from that source is God himself. And the more aware you are that God is in you because Jesus gave himself to you, the easier you will find it to interact with the people in your life through the lens of God's love. And the coming together of love God and love neighbor become concrete. We hear at the end of this passage that our reason reaches its limit. Our reason cannot make sense of the fact that bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus. Our reason can't accept that. The apostles did not say, we understand. They say, where would we go? We have come to believe. And when our reason reaches its limit, then he teaches us here that our response is to bow low in adoration and unbounded love. To say, Lord, I trust you. Think about that posture as the posture of a child. Your child does not understand the stuff that you explain to them, but they love you, they trust you. That's the posture of our response to God. And then finally, the next quote about the Lord's Day. So this is a whole document that's teaching us how we can better take advantage of the commandment that says, keep holy the Lord's Day. So I am with you always to the end of the age, as he quotes from Matthew. This promise of Christ never ceases to resound in the church as the fertile secret of her life and the wellspring of her hope. As the day of resurrection, Sunday is not only the remembrance of a past event, it is the celebration of the living presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his own people. Jesus present, here now. Everything we learn of in the gospel, that Jesus here present every time we gather with the community of faith to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord on Sunday. For his presence to be properly proclaimed and lived, it is not enough that the disciples of Christ pray individually and commemorate the death of and resurrection of Christ inwardly in the secrecy of their hearts. Those who have received the grace of baptism are not saved as individuals alone, but as members of the mystical body, having become part of the people of God. It is important, therefore, that they come together to express fully the very identity of the church. And what is the identity of the church? Communion. And so if you're not at Mass on Sunday, you literally leave a hole because no one else is you. No one else can fill your place because God did not give you life in the beginning as one more random part of humanity. God gave you life as you, filling you with everything that he knows you can bring to the world. And when you absent yourself, a hole is left and the communion of the church is weakened. And so we are called to take our place so that we are strengthened, so that by our presence, the whole church is strengthened. This is the communion that we celebrate when we come forward and receive the Eucharist. This is the bigger picture of what we are hoping for your children. And so having taken time to reflect on these realities now, we're going to ask the Lord to deepen this understanding in us. Because I'm trying to talk to you about heavenly realities, about the things of God. My ability to communicate this to you is extremely limited. But it is God himself who can speak in your heart. 
It is God himself who can enhance your awareness of the possibility of communion. It is God who can help you identify every obstacle to your greater communion. And so as we take some time to reflect now, pray that tonight and the months that come leading up to the celebration of First Communion can help you really internalize these realities. The gift of God, the communion that God desires for you, and sharing this moment with your child and with your family that the bond may grow deeper, that the abundance of life itself may be experienced because of your closeness with God. So I'm going to ask you to answer a question you can write on the back of your paper. Having reflected on these things, and as you take time in prayer now, I want you to articulate what is your goal, what is your goal for your child and for your family as you prepare for First Communion? What is your goal? Articulate that as part of your prayer now. And then while you're here, present with the Lord, ask God to help you fulfill that goal. In fact, I encourage you to set a goal for yourself that you cannot fulfill on your own. Don't set your sights too low. Hold up for yourself a goal that is impossible except for the grace of God. So that coming forward confidently, depending on the grace of God and by the power of God, that's the goal that can be accomplished as your child and your family celebrate this day. So I would ask everyone to please kneel as I expose the Blessed Sacrament and after it is exposed, you're welcome to kneel or sit, whichever is more comfortable to take this time in prayer. And then I will finish uh, with a blessing for everyone. Lord Jesus, as we kneel before you this evening, we thank you for the gift of yourself. As we imagine the God who created the universe, who gave us life, our place in this world, and who calls us to deeper unity with you. As we imagine how great and powerful you are, we look upon you having come to us in this humble form. You, for whom all things are possible, you sent your Son to die and rise so that we might have life. But then still more, you give him to us as food. In what appears to be bread and wine, we find the very source and summit of our life. 
As we take on the journey of this preparation for First Communion, we place in your care the precious children who are preparing for this moment. May our growth in faith and holiness be a witness to them so that together we may grow in the bond of family and faith, the bond of love that gives us life. We place in your care this evening the intentions that fill our hearts, the worries and preoccupations that we have, the challenges that we bear. May we see everything through the lens of your life and love and find all our strength in you. As I now give your blessing to these, your precious children here, fill their hearts with the renewal of your love in their lives. That concludes our evening. Thank you. Have a safe trip home.